More inclusive teams produce better business results. That is fact. Hello and welcome everyone to the New Rules of Work, a podcast from the Muse where we explore the changing landscape of work and the dynamic between employers and talent. I'm Catherine Minshew, CEO and co-founder of the Muse. Now, our guest today, I am incredibly excited about. She served as the CEO of Travelocity and Guilt. She was the Global Consumer Chief Marketing and Internet Officer of Citigroup. And she was a White House Fellow and Senior Advisor to Labor Secretary Alexis Herman. She serves on the Board of Directors for Nike, Nonprofit TechnoServe, and Tech NYC. And now, uh, Michelle Peluso is currently the Senior Vice President of Digital Sales and Chief Marketing Officer at IBM. Michelle, welcome to the New Rules of Work. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Thrilled to be here. Always excited to do anything with the Muse. I love it. Well, I was going to say, I, I have uh, followed your career for a long time. You've been such an incredible advisor uh, to, to me and to so many other entrepreneurs in New York. So it's really an honor to have you on the podcast and to dive in a little bit today um, into your background, into uh, some of your career tips and some of the lessons you've learned in the last several years. Let's do it. Excellent. So, um, you know, I think anyone who listened to me introduce you all of the different incredible positions you've hold, it's pretty clear that you have had such an incredible career path. And so I wanted to actually start by talking through your career journey. Um, you've been in different industries, you know, technology, fashion, banking, et cetera. What are some of the things that motivated or inspired you at the various steps along the way? You know, that is just a good question. I have always really thought there were a few common elements to all the career decisions I have made and, and been faced with. And I think in some ways, these principles have been in some guiding North Stars for me. The first one is I really always want to work with people I know I can learn from. And when I was even early in my career, when I was choosing consulting coming out of graduate school, I had different offers from different companies. I chose the Boston Consulting Group, even though for a variety of reasons, they didn't treat my graduate degree as equivalent to an MBA. So the pay was less, the title was less than I could have gotten at other leading firms. But I felt passionately that I could learn the most from the team I had met at BCG. And that idea of always working for leaders and with teams that I share their values, but I, I really feel like I can learn has served me incredibly well. So in the various jobs, career decisions I've made, being surrounded by exceptional people has been a, really a North Star for me. And I think that's particularly important when you're early in your career, because so much of your first five, 10 years in the workforce is really, of course, having an impact and doing what you love. But it's also about learning how to be successful in the professional world. And so being surrounded by really smart people who take time and consideration on developing you and helping you grow is a tremendous asset. Beyond that, I've always loved being at the intersection of technology and people. And it's such an exciting time. And I've had so many opportunities in my career to be at the forefront uh, in how digital is remaking industries. That is something I'm incredibly passionate about. And finally, I like to be on a mission. I like teams that are on a mission. I actually like it sometimes to be a little bit of the underdog, to have to think differently, to take risks, to be bold. So I would say those three things have been overarching in all of my career. I love that. And, you know, it's funny, people ask me all the time, you know, how do I get from X to Y in my career, et cetera. And, and my advice is actually so similar to what you said, which is I always start with, you know, work with people who you can learn from, just be a sponge, especially in the early days. And so I, I love that you, that you started with that too. Yeah. Well, you know, what's so funny about that, right? We're so used to, I think we, you know, go to school and then you're kind of done with learning. And I feel passionately as is, you know, Ginny Rometty, our chairperson and CEO, she really feels and she states very eloquently that, especially with today's technologies, artificial intelligence and like, every job will be different. Every job is being reshaped and remade by these explosive technologies. So it's a reminder for us that, our job is to be lifelong learners. So starting that early, surrounding yourself with people you can learn from is a great way to begin. 
I love that. I love that. And I may come back to that later, but something else that I wanted to ask you about, which I omitted from uh, the list of accolades in my introduction of you, but is obviously very, very important is you're also a mom. And thank you so yes. much for giving me the okay to ask you about this. <laughs> of course, of course. I often just, you know, you, you can cut my bio down to something very simple, which is I work and I'm a mom. <laughs> Absolutely. And both of those things take up a lot of time. And so, yeah. you know, as, as a full-time working mother who has spent many, many years in the C-suite and playing a variety of executive roles, can you talk a little bit about your experience? Because, you know, you're currently leading a team of, I think, nearly 7,000 people. How do you think about balancing your time? It is the most important question, and I'm not even sure balance is the right word, but I am ruthless with how I use my time, and I had to learn that lesson early on. I was pregnant as a CEO of Travelocity, and at that time, there really wasn't wow. um, many examples, and so some of it hit the press, and, and the team was in the board. Everyone was kind of trying to figure out, how, <laughs> what do you do with a pregnant CEO? And so I had to fast kind of figure out how I was going to work. For me, it's always been, you know, how do I try to do the very best I can at being a professional and exercising my mind and my desire to have impact in the world and to work with a great team with being a mom and my desire to be as present as I possibly can be so, so they can be all they're meant to be. So I, I actually leave the office at 5 or 5.30 every day. I do that religiously. I go home, I, you know, I'm there for a sort of dinner and homework and bedtime, and then I work again afterwards. Look, I know a lot of women don't have a kind of ownership of their schedule that, that I can have, but I do think some of these tips and tricks apply to all of us. First of all, I'm incredibly, incredibly focused on what matters and outcomes, and I really think hard in any job, in any assignment, in any given week, in any given meeting. I think about this at a micro level and a macro level. What is it I'm here to accomplish? What, what is the best use of my time? I don't believe in, you know, being on every steering committee and hours. I really focus on. I, I, I strongly believe what, you know, is usually an hour on the calendar can be done in half an hour. With a half an hour can be done in 15 or 20 minutes. So. I push both in my own work and in teams that I'm part of, what are, what are the outcomes we're trying to achieve? And how do we use our time best? When I'm on long flights, I often have printed my calendar from the previous three months, and I spend time thinking about what do I want to achieve this quarter? What's most important to me in my personal life with my kids, in my community life, in my professional life? What would be the best, the things I want to achieve, and hence, how should my time be aligned? And then I look at the previous past few months. Am I spending my time that way? And invariably, I find a lot of things that I change on that plane ride. I don't necessarily need all the one-on-ones if teams are doing really well. We don't have to keep that standing meeting just because we always have. I'm, so I really try to align my time with what I think are the most important priorities. That means, back to my first point, I have to be surrounded by great teams. So really making sure that, you know, I had an old boss, Manuel Medina Mora, who was president of Citigroup and a tremendous role model and mentor for me. And he said, you know, before any journey, you look at the, at the you know, the journey you're about to embark on and you really make sure you have the right people in the boat with you. And that's always been very top of mind for me to make sure on any given project assignment, outcome I'm trying to drive, do I have the right people in the boat with me? And to take the time to assess that and make the changes needed. I'm also a huge believer in Agile. So I grew up learning Agile as a uh, early days in Travelocity, right after the Agile Manifesto was written in 2002. We were one of the first companies to move software development to Agile. So I have always believed that there's principles in Agile that provide better ways of working. Um, and now at IBM, we're the first at scale in marketing to have Agile as a discipline for all of our marketers around the world. And we can certainly talk about that more, but I do believe that Agile forces humility and retrospection. So you're always thinking about what you can do better with your time, with your team, with your work. And I think it's a, a great approach to prioritize. You have a fixed amount of capacity amongst your teams. You're always thinking about your backlog and what's the best use of your time. It's very outcome driven, outcome centric. So you're always looking, you know, you have to take the time at the outset to figure out what metrics you're trying to move and make sure the work aligns with that and your retrospective aligns with that. So there's a lot of things that I really try to practice as a discipline from, from the Agile practice. So maybe just a few tips, but those are some of the things that 
help never make it perfect, <laughs> but help make sure that I can uh, be the mom I want to be and the professional I want to be. Absolutely. And, and um, you know, I think that, that that focus on, you know, in agile and in and on a quarterly basis, looking back, assessing what went well, what didn't, were you focused on the right things? And then using that as input to be more strategic about how you spend your time and how you allocate your tasks and resources ahead. I mean, it's, it's so powerful and yet I'm constantly, you know, forgetting to do it when life gets too crazy. So I think that's exactly. a, a really important reminder. Yeah. It's like plain time can sometimes be really, really useful. If you take the time to print out three months of your calendar and you put it in your, um, in your bag, I guarantee you, you're going to want to have that thing shredded just to take the weight off by the time you get to your destination. So it will be a forcing function on the plane to go through it. So you can kind of shred it and leave it behind, carry a little bit less back with you than you went out with. Yeah, I love it. I'm actually going on a plane tomorrow. So uh, maybe I'll have a new, <laughs> a new uh, stack of paper new, weighing down my carry on way of working. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I'm kind of piggybacking off the idea of, of, you know, some of the things that you've done to, uh, uh, to better fit, maybe we'll use fit instead of balance, those, those different parts of your life together. I loved really reading and learning more about how IBM has a tech reentry program, um, yeah. which is, you know, a, a paid returnship for people who are looking to restart their careers after taking a break from work, which could be for family reasons, health reasons. You know, there's a lot of different reasons someone might yeah. want or need to take some time off. Can you tell us a little bit more about this program and, and the impact it's had? Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, elevating qualified women in the workplace is not only important, but it's essential. We know more and more that more inclusive teams produce, drive more creativity, more innovation, and produce better economic results. And that equation has been solidified time and time again here, especially in the past few years. So making sure at IBM that we are attracting world-class inclusive teams, certainly women, people of color, different nationalities, orientations, et cetera, is a huge, huge, um, uh, frankly, privilege for us and opportunity to, to drive great results. So Tech Reentry is a program that is really powerful. And our Tech Reentry program at scale, we bring women back to 12-week internships. So they come for a three-day orientation. They get placed into one of our different businesses. They get a mentor. They work on actual projects. And the idea is to help make sure that these, you know, quote unquote, interns have a much smoother reentry back to the workforce. And also to give our managers a chance to get up to speed and see the interns work uh, as they hire them. So we really focus on it, especially for talented technical professionals who maybe took a break from their career and now want to restart their careers. And they're interested in coming back and seeing how their expertise and their abilities can lend themselves to full-time employment. So this is a great program and a great way that IBM has of attracting really diverse and terrific talent. Yeah, I love that because I think, you know, our our companies and our workforces would be so much better off if more of them were more open to people who had taken time off or who needed that kind of reentry. And, and I think it's really powerful thinking about how, you know, what role can organizations and businesses play in making it easier for, for, you know, to, to reenter. Well, there's no so, doubt, there's no doubt that, you know, um, we have got to, as companies do a better job overall in understanding, you know, in the whole gamut of learning that more and more skills matter over degrees and frankly, even over necessarily tenure. So whether it's attracting new kinds of talent into the workforce, we have a program, for instance, PTAC, where we now have 140,000 young people around the world in 14 countries that do a six-year program. So it's four-year high school degree, two-year associate degree, in a lot of very tough neighborhoods, by the way. STEM education, and they intern over that period of time, over those six years. So we have many of those interns here at IBM, but this is a partnership with other companies and with state and local governments to make sure we're attracting new forms of talent. And, and by the way, these young people are tremendous, and they get such a leg up by getting in six years sort of high school and associate degree and having six years of work experience. Yeah, I love that. And I thought, you know, it was neat. It was really powerful for me to see 
when I was preparing for this episode, IBM has received a number of catalyst awards for yeah. its leadership yeah. in building a workplace that values diversity and inclusion. And, you know, when you think kind of broadly, I know you touched on it a little bit, but what does DNI look like at IBM today? And, you know, for, for people that might be pushing for their own workplaces to be more inclusive and more diverse, are there any either, you know, stories of, of how it's worked particularly well or kind of examples sure. of DNI programs in action? Yes, and I can be really explicit on this one because it's a huge passion point of mine. In the 1950s, the IBM chairman and CEO wrote policy letter number four, which said that this is a decade ahead of the Civil Rights Act, that we would never discriminate based on race, gender, orientation, and the like. So DNI is something that is our DNA. And I think that um, means that, you know, for me, I get to run the women's program for IBM Globally, the executive sponsor for all women at IBM. That's a huge honor and a huge privilege to stand on the back of a giant like that and to know that our job, my job, is to carry that ball forward to make it uh, an even more equitable, just, and inclusive environment for women. Here's the good news, and it really is good news. We just completed, I co-authored a study of 2,300 C-suite um, from all around the world, pretty extensive interviews with all of them. And the bottom line is, it is a very simple process to have more inclusion at your company. And here's the recipe. Number one, it has to be a business priority. It's not a nice to have. And any of us that are thinking about DNI as a nice to have miss the fundamental point. More inclusive teams produce better business results. That is fact. And so if that's true, it needs to be a business priority. When a company makes inclusion and diversity a business priority, you find they do things like they would do with all their business priorities. They invest, they measure, they reward, they punish. And so companies that uh, we found, 13% of companies that produced superior economic results and had much stronger and more inclusive teams, they line it up as a business priority from the top down, and then they really align the sort of resources and metrics. We know more than ever about how to use technology to take bias out of recruiting, interviewing, compensation decisions, those moments that matter. So at IBM, we think about those moments that matter a lot. Um, all of our employees go through bias training, as you would expect. But we have, we use Watson to make sure that after everybody makes their comp decisions, there are algorithms that are run to see, is there bias in these compensation decisions based on someone's skills, based on their performance results, based on their job quality? Should they be receiving differential pay? So we take bias and we use Watson others to take bias out of recruiting job plays. So, uh, uh, even the way we write interview uh, sort of open requisitions we know there are certain words that really bias the field. So we spend a lot of time thinking about how technology in the moments that matter, along with great training of our people, can produce more inclusive results. And we don't do it because we think it's, you know, nice to have and because we have daughters and we care about them. We do it because it's the right thing to do to drive innovation, creativity, and economic return at IBM. I love that. And I think that that clear-cut and forceful business case and moral cases is, is so important. And as you said, it shows up in the data and it shows up in our business's ability to innovate. So I love that. So we are almost out of time. And I wanted to close by asking you a broader question about industry trends that is near and dear to my own heart. And, you know, you probably, anybody who's heard me talk about the muse has probably heard me say that one of the most fascinating things for me right now in talent and hiring and HR is how much that industry is, is really adopting a lot of principles of marketing. You know, companies need to think about building awareness for their, for their organization as a place yeah. to work. They have to wonder what sort of consideration set are they in and what information are people finding if they're doing research and there's conversion questions and nurture questions. And like, I could geek out on this for hours, <laughs> but given that we don't have hours, you know, as, as you know, you've come up through or, or sort of through both the, the, you know, overall CEO executive side of the house, you're the CMO now as, as you know, you, you've seen this from a lot of different angles and what's a trend that is top of mind for you or that you're excited about in terms of how HR and talent can learn from or adopt the best of marketing? Well, first of all, Catherine, I think it's one of the reasons that what you have done with the Muse is so awesome and the community you've built because HR is now at the forefront of company strategy in, in good companies, really thinking through, to your point, that funnel 
from consideration to relevance to preference to retention. I mean, it's, it's a lot, as you suggest, like a marketing funnel. And what I would just say is anytime marketers think about their own funnel, they have to think about a few things. Number one, what's the big idea? What's the mission? What's the purpose? What are the values? What's the big idea? IBM is sort of era after era changing the way the world works. That is our mission. That's the big idea. So whether we think about that from a marketing perspective or we think about that from a talent and recruiting perspective, we know that that's the draw. We know that people come to IBM, be they clients or be they employees, because they're innovators, they're passionate, they want to change how the world works. And they want to do it at a company where they can trust that, you know, privacy and principles and integrity and inclusion, all of these values are at the forefront of our company. I think as we continue, as any marketer continues down the funnel, they have to think about how, what about data? What about technology? How do we make sure that we're translating that big idea in the channels that matter most to people in the ways that people are having conversations and the places where those conversations are happening? So, just like in marketing from a recruiting and a talent perspective, we've got to think about making sure we intercept the right populations at the right time with our message. And then finally, of course, any great marketer cares about lifetime value, not just about acquisition. And so that means how you think and about retention, expansion, you know, from a client perspective, well, it's as relevant as you think about talent. How do you think about making sure your best talent continues to learn and grow and stretch and day and expand their capability and their ability to have impact at your company. So I think you're really wise when you think about you know, the comparisons you make. And I would say, much like marketers, the big idea plus sort of data and technology to allow you to hit the right channels with the right message at the right time and a real focus on lifetime value, retention, expansion, et cetera, is as important for an HR team as it is for a marketing team. It doesn't work if there's not authenticity at the heart of a marketing message, and it doesn't work if there's not authenticity at the heart of an HR message as well. Yeah. I mean, you can't see me, but I'm literally fist pumping right now because, <laughs> I think it's, um, you know, I, 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 first of all, I loved when you called out the, the lifetime value and the fact that, you know, at the end of the day, if all we're focused on as hiring managers and leaders and recruiters is getting people in the door, um, we're missing so much of the value. We're missing the fact that, you know, bringing the right people in who will be successful, who will stay, who will be engaged and productive employees is, is really the name of the game. And so that means being more transparent and authentic with people before they come in. You know, it means thinking about how you're investing in hiring, not just, you know, to, to fill a role, but to think about finding that person who's going to be successful and who's going to stay. And so I, I love that. I love that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Michelle, for joining us and for being so open and for any listeners who are interested in learning more about what it's like to work for IBM, you can check out their profile on themuse.com. Uh, take a peek at their open roles. It's themuse.com slash company slash IBM. You can also search the site for IBM or you can go uh, to their website. Thank you so much, Michelle. It's been such a pleasure to have you and take care, everybody. The Muse is the best place to research companies and careers. More than 75 million people each year trust The Muse to help them win at work, from finding a job to building the skills to help them grow and advance. Organizations use our platform to attract and hire talent by providing an authentic look at company culture, workplace, and values through the stories of their employees. You've been listening to The New Rules of Work. To learn more about this episode and to research companies and jobs, visit themuse.com. To ensure you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast player. If you have any questions for The Muse or for host Catherine Minshew, feel free to reach out to press at themuse.com. Thank you for listening. Until next time.